really glad to be here. And what I'd like to tell you about tonight is the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute. And hopefully you're looking at uh, my first, first slide. Somebody shout if you're not. So this is West Africa and there's a problem of lack of capacity in West Africa, yet it's one of the, sorry, there we are. It's one of the areas of the planet that is in most need of conservation capacity. If you have a look at the population demographics in any of the West African countries, there, the rate of increase is, is eye-watering uh, in some of them and concomitant standard of living, uh, GDPR, that uh, GDP, it's all at a relatively low level. And consequently, there's massive pressure uh, on the environment. And to solve these problems, you need local experts, but there are very few local experts. And I'm an ornithologist, uh, birdie person, uh, and in Europe, there are lots of people like me, lots of people that know about how to solve conservation problems, how to understand uh, conflicts between humans and uh, wildlife, how to solve them. But with, within West Africa, there is almost nobody. Uh, the picture on the right there um, is Gus Azelia. He, at the time that I met him, uh, was the only person in Nigeria with a PhD in an ornithology conservation uh, related uh, subject. So this is back in the early, early 90s. And things have got better. And if you look at that graph down there, bottom right, this is the evidence that things have got better. So this is the number, it's an index of the number of conservation papers that have been produced um, with year in uh, Africa, all sub-Saharan African countries. And so it looks great, you think, more conservation papers, more conservation expertise, more conservation capacity. But when you drill down into it and look at those bottom two lines, what we're looking at there are essentially the ratio of papers that are produced where the first author is somebody like me, somebody that parachutes into Africa. They might do, I hope, good, good conservation research, research work, but essentially it's external capacity that's driving it. If you look, the other line is for, if you like, homegrown experts, people from, say, Liberia or Nigeria that are first authors on the papers. And as things get better within Africa, you would expect those two lines to diverge because then we'd have people, we'd have a change from this parachuting in and we'd have the homegrown capacity, but that isn't happening. So what do we do about it? Well, this is about APLORI, the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute. How do you create capacity in Africa? Well, surprisingly straightforward, actually. First thing you do is um, you build a little building and create little bits of infrastructure. Then you get some students and provide scholarships for those students. And then you take those students out and you teach them and give them a conservation background, a research master's background. We're operating in the middle of Nigeria. Nigeria is the most uh, highly populated country in Africa. It's quite an incredible uh, country to visit. It's a fantastic place in terms of opportunity, in terms of just sheer raw human talent, but very few opportunities for conservationists. So, we have a small number of students, but we're selecting them from a very large pool of very capable people. So we end up with very, very good students. And our teaching model, the essence of trying to kickstart the capacity uh, for conservation is to bring in invited lecturers from all over the planet, mostly Europe, some, sometimes uh, US, 
other parts of Africa and inspire the students, give them the best, uh, most highest level education um, experience uh, that they can, can get. And it works. This is uh, class of 2016. We started in 2002. We've been going for about uh, 20 years. And each year we've produced a cohort of about 10 students. And these students have gone on to do things. Our model is to bring students up to a really good level of international masters, which then makes them very, very one for a better word, saleable in the rest of the world. There are lots of US universities that really want to, to do the right thing, would love to support a student from West Africa, but who do they support? We can give them you know, the background, the stamp of authority, the reference, so that they can get into these PhD programs, these training programs. And we have about a 50% uh, conversion rate in terms of our master students then going on to do uh, PhDs, but the best thing of all is that when they've done their PhDs, they might do them in the US, might do them in Oxford or whatever, they come back, they come back to Africa. So there's a lot of very positive destinations in education speak. We've got uh, a lot of our students have gone on to do uh, research, teaching, lecturing in universities, a good quarter of them working within NGOs within Africa, conservation NGOs, and a good proportion working in government. And has this made a difference? Yes, it has. You can measure the change. So if you look at the left-hand side, this is, uh, again, just looking at an index of the number of papers. These, this is ornithology-related uh, papers. And... The bottom dotted line is the rest of West Africa, and then you've got the Nigerian trajectory, and you can see it starts kicking up just as we've created that lorry, and then it tracks the production of research papers produced from that lorry. And the right hand graph shows Nigeria overtaking the worst performing country in Europe, which is Greece. I don't know, go figure, maybe in Greece it's just such lovely weather and you sit on the beach all day rather than doing uh, doing research. But anyway, demonstrably uh, a clear effect of improving capacity uh, in West Africa. There's a massive long way to go, of course. And if you start at the very low baseline, you can see change uh, very quickly. Anyway, you don't want to hear from me and the best people to tell you about App Laurie, how it works, and actually its results are its graduates. So um, we've got lined up four graduates for you, uh, spread out through the 20-year uh, period, more or less. And our first one I would like to introduce you to is uh, Nanshin. So over to you, Nanshin. So um, thank you, Will, for the introduction. So I'll be telling you a brief story of mine with Aplari. So presently, um, on my screen that you're seeing is, that's the campus, the aerial view of the reserve, right? The Institute. And like um, Professor Will just said, um, almost 20 years of capacity building. Right, so I'll just go straight ahead to tell you about my story. I wouldn't start without showing you the eyes, the cute eyes of this puppy, because uh, my first love for nature started with dogs, actually. Um, I, my siblings and I found some stray puppies, and boom, that's where it all started for me. Um, so, so now about Aplori, Naibab, and my volunteering journey, all courtesy and the goodwill of Aplori, because through it, I was able to be exposed to really what I love, that's nature, and actually just moving out and trying to share what I know with others. So from starting with learning, this picture right here was the first time I was in Aplori in 2014, right? And with so many expectations, and believe me, none of them was dashed. 
In fact, I, I, I got a lot, you know, from the early morning erotology classes that you have to go out for the first six months as a student. So this is my set. And this particular picture is interesting because on the panel of speakers today, this one here is Dr. Sam Evande, and here is Dr. Onoja. And this is somewhere March 2015, you know, and a very exciting time, I must say. And unlike the normal classroom in Nigeria setting, um, coming to Aplori is a different ball game. You know, you, you, you get to interact with your tutors. You know, you feel comfortable, really a very conducive and comfortable learning atmosphere. So this picture here is when Professor Will finished his statistics classes and then you, you get to sit down and have a chit chat. You know, this is something that is very important because you really get to focus and to really want to know more, given the fact that uh, you all are just treated like, okay, my teacher is not better than I, you know, I'm not, the, <laughs> okay, in the Nigerian towns, you say Oga, but then here, yeah, everybody is carried along and you really have a conducive atmosphere to learn. So, um, and immediately after Aplori, I was privileged to present my master's found, um, findings at the Pan-African Ontological uh, Congress. Sorry. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. And I was opportune to present my findings and I got interested with uh, in this bird, the African trash. So the African trash loves to feed on the ground. And this particular bird, I got interested in the, in the bird because of its feeding habit actually. And interestingly, at the end of the research, we're able to find out that this bird actually picked on the way it feeds uh, on the ground, it picks on the poo around. So open defecation, this bird feeds on, and then we find in the birds, the intestinal parasites of humans, but that doesn't affect actually the body condition of the birds, but it goes along with to show that it can carry this parasite and then move it from one place to the other. And then in the next slide, Uh, my next journey, I was um, I was able to be part of the student conference on conservation science in Cambridge in 2018, and from there I moved on to Scotland to do my internship uh, at St Andrews University with Professor Will, and it's from here that I was able to be part of uh, my first peer review paper, right? And it was a wonderful time and an exciting experience for me. And going ahead from there, I was able to present the, um, the work of the Nigerian Bird Atlas project in a bit. I will tell us more about this. I was able to present it to the African Bird Club um, AGM. That's in same 2018. So for the first time, uh, we're able to present part of the finding of this, um, of this project to the international uh, audience where we, 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 we pass out the vision so that we be able to get more to join us on this. And then part of the journey again is when I attend the International Ontological Congress at, uh, in Canada. And in this particular, uh, Congress or conference, I, I met and I was able to, to have a, a brief chat with uh, Professor Andrew Gosler. And it really got to change my point of view about religion and then people. You know, in Nigeria, we tend to like connect religion with what we do. But then Andy with a scholar, a bishop, and then he was like, you know, in all of this that we do, our common religion is conservation. 
for whatsoever one would take to study, as long as the environment is involved, that is our religion. And from there, I took home a very important lesson, you know, and all through all this uh, meeting that I've been through, meeting in fantastic and intelligent people presenting diverse research about birds and the environment. You know, it's motivated me to do more. And so coming back home to Aplory uh, in 2017, after my studies there, I came back in as a research associate and I'm involved in presently in ecological field research. And some of the things we do presently at Aplory is to have different research group. And I belong to the, to the biogeographic and macroecology group where we're able to look at or to study how the reserve over time has evolved and how it's becoming a safe haven for diversity, different diversity of birds and other uh, plants and animals. And believe me, the result is exciting and very soon we'll be sharing that. And the, or the other thing that I do there at Aplory is to take on students out for field trip. And the picture right here is a present uh, MSc students where we move out trying to look at um, urbanization and the distribution of birds around us. And not just that, we also um, take in uh, visiting institutions in Aplory and there we're able to tell them about the environment you know, and I, in particular, I love the, the great school, you know, because these are young minds. They are actually curious. If you are looking carefully at the, the picture, you see how intentional they are to listen. So from here is the hope that out of 10, we'll be able to have five that will come up and want to do something with conservation and better still, something to do with the birds. Because you see here in Nigeria, when you mention birds, you watch birds, they were like, oh, this is weird. But then when we catch them young, we're able to build and to come up with something reasonable in the future. And so now moving on to NIBAP, um, Nigerian Bird Atlas Project, uh, established in 20, 2015, and as a citizen science project. And what we do is to, map the bird distribution all over Nigeria. And while we are out in the field, we try to set up bird clubs. And so this is one of the bird clubs that we just set up in uh, Gashaka Gumti. That was last year. So actually me and the team members with the Gashaka Gumti bird club members. And another thing we do as a project, um, NIBAP. And before I forget, this NIBAP is actually supported by the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute. And so we move around to also um, give talks and organize workshops and through that collaborate with different organizations to be able to move the project forward. And so in this picture, we are able to, to have a workshop with the National Park Service at their headquarters in Abuja. And so after that, we're able to move out into the field and to get people to be familiar with the app that you can use in the field to upload bird observation into the database. And more on NIBAP, again, in the field, we're able to meet uh, young minds, interns that are out there doing what they do best, but then when we meet with them, this picture is actually taken at, uh, in a cave in Ingeliaki, where we move around with the interns. And there along, we were able to, to introduce the project and uh, also talk about conservation and birds. And so many are able to buy in into what we're doing as well. And another thing we do out there in the field is also to to environmental education. So this chick of a heron, I got to get, I, I collected it from a fisherman and he explaining the fact that he wants to go and then rear it in his own house. 
So the, the thing is, when we get things like this, we try to, to, to give them what we know about these birds. You know, when you take them out, we have an imbalance. So for us to have a balanced ecosystem, all this needs to also survive as you also need to survive. So part of what we do is to give, to tell them this with the hope that we have a change in mindset, not just you being in the classroom, but even to the people outside there to be able to have a picture of actually what we need to have out there in the environment. So with all this that we do in NIBA, we are able to have this present coverage map, right? And presently we have out of the 11,088 uh, pentads, 4,675 have been visited. That's like approximately 42% of the entire country. And so with all the strategy that we are putting in together, it's actually working for the project and moving forward. And so talking about my volunteering part of the work, so having fun while doing my work. So the Just Bed Club, I would like to mention here. So this is another avenue that we give back. You know, since Nigeria is a society where bed watching seems to be like a strange thing, so the, the thing we do as a part of the NIBAP strategy is to create bed clubs. And on this, in this particular bed club, I volunteer to coordinate the outings and we visit different sites in JAWS, doing bed watching and enjoying nature work. While we do that, people become aware of the environment and the need to also be part of conserving it. So in all of these experiences that I have, there are a lot of challenges out there, you know, from you trying to cross the river with a boat that is, unfortunately, I don't know how to swim. Yeah, but then we managed to like cross over, you know, from crossing the river to a muddy rut, uh, route, a place that you need just 30 minutes to travel to from one painter to the other. At the end of the day, you end up spending two hours, you know, so for me to just have a break and snap close to this bike, you know, because a click tells you a thousand, a thousand of stories. So actually a long story behind this click, I'm smiling, but it's not really funny. So, and then another thing is when you are out there in the field, you know, you see that most areas are prone to overgrazing due to indiscriminate uh, access by pastoral, um, this has men. You know, and down in the southern part of Nigeria, another place that we went down at Lassen, this beautiful tree has been cut down. And then another part is a field, just field of a field with lots of crops, but then just close to it, there's a farmland. And so they spread in chemicals. And you see a lot of beautiful crops, but unfortunately, most of them are dead. So I have to pick these two and put them side by side with the hope that when you show this, it will be able to speak to the hearts of people. So like we try to use the environment more sustainably, you know? So, and for all of this and with all the experience and that I've learned from Uplory and down to the field to volunteering, I'm able to put all of these things together. And right now I'll be presenting them in my thesis, my PhD thesis that I've just registered with the University of Just. So I'll be focusing on the change in environment, looking at climate change and the land use change as well and how it affects bird distribution. And since birds are bioindicators, we hope that when we project this, it will be able to speak for all the species that are utilizing the environment. And to end my talk, from the words of Sir Isaac Newton, you know, I have stood on the shoulders of giants. I am still standing on the shoulders of giants. And I will hope one day will be a giant that others too will stand on so that we all have a better future. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Nanchin. We, we're going to have questions and a, a 
appreciation at, at the end. And I'm going to go straight on and introduce our, ne our next speaker, uh, who is, uh, I know him as OJ. And in fact, if you met him on the street, he's OJ. And he'll tell you about his Aplori journey. OJ. All right, thank you very much, Will, and uh, thank you everyone for having me tonight uh, to talk about my Aplori journey. So I'm Joseph Onoja, and I deliberately wrote my designation there as the Director General, CEO of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. It's very important that I give this background so that you will be able to understand um, the how all of these tie together um, during my presentation. Uh, so as um, as a way of introduction, let me start by saying that um, from anecdotal evidence, upward of 75% of the students that I've known that end up studying um, zoology or natural sciences actually wanted to study medicine or pharmacy or any of those quote unquote lucrative um, courses. So um, for me, it was, uh, I've only met only one person who actually set out and said, yes, I wanted to study zoology right from 100 level. And that's Professor Zing Fawala, who happens to be a graduate also of uh, Aplori and is based in South Africa at the moment. So I found this category of people who wanted to study medicine, but found myself in, uh, in, in zoology. Though I grew up what I call in a countryside where I, 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 was, um, I was hunting birds, I must say, growing up, it was part of a childhood fun, um, running around the rocks and uh, hunting and, uh, and knowing these birds by their call and by their colors and so on. For instance, for those of you who know the red chick cordon blue, we used to call it the blue assisi. Uh, yeah, it was when I got into, um, I mean, uh, Plurry that I got to know that, oh, okay, actually, this actually called the red chicken on blue. Uh, so the first two years was uh, in zoology. It was very frustrating, I must say, until I met um, Aplori during my internship in the next year. And I must say that Aplori gave me purpose. Now, it's important for me to, to state it here that um, we want to study some of these um, good courses, quote and unquote, not just because of the passion that we have, but it also ties to um, economic, uh, the, the economic component of it. because. Um, at least it's tied to the fact that when you have a good cause, then you'll be able to get a good job and then you'll be able to pay well and then you'll be able to take care of your family. So that also has its own side of it. But I must say, Aplori gave me purpose, not just to pursue my um, passion in terms of ornithology and conservation biology, but also to provide the means, I mean, the economy that um, we were wanted to use uh, the lucrative courses uh, to, uh, to achieve. So in this picture, which I pulled out, I mean, it's been very long, so I had to dig it up. And this is uh, Mary Moloku in the middle of there. She was my supervisor when I was in, uh, when I was on the, I mean, uh, undergrad in Aplori, came for my internship. So Aplori started for me uh, 2017 and uh, 2007 and 2008. And I must say that it was an intensive um, studies in Aplori. So that, that year, we normally go out every morning um, from 6.30 to 10 o'clock every day, Mondays to Fridays, um, studying birds and learning birds and their calls and so on. So my childhood dream, my childhood passion just came up alive, but now in a more scientific way. So I was able to place names of birds to the calls uh, based on what I have learned while growing up. And I must say that uh, Professor Manu was uh, very instrumental uh, to, at this stage because we were always with him in the morning and uh, Uve and so on, and all the people around us who really um, helped us through the period. I used to say that a plurry one year is like you running a marathon for that one year, so that when you finish, the ability to stop is not there. You just want to continue running because you've been running for the past one year. It's so intense. But that has helped us shape us and provided the platform and built the capacity that we needed to be able to do what we are doing uh, today as conservation biologists. So when I left Aplori, I, I worked a bit with uh, Mary Moloku until I was now um, drafted into Yankari Game Reserve, uh, the Aplori Research Center there. 
Uh, in, the, in the Apollo Research Center, we were, I was supposed to be uh, designing and implementing conservation projects. And Aplori helps us not just to be a researcher, but to be an independent researcher where you are able to dream of a concept, you are able to put the concept in paper, you are able to convince funders to be able to provide funds for you, and then you are able to get these funds and carry out your project. So Aplori makes us kind of a, a well-rounded um, conservation biologist. So with that, when I was in the Ankara Game Reserve, I got um, Ruford Grant. So I, while I was there, there was a, there's a road that was constructed in the reserve. It's a paved road. Um, it's a 42 kilometer road, very paved, and I can say that it's one of the best roads in Nigeria. So looking at that, and I noticed that there were a lot of road kills on that road, and I decided to write Ruford to give me a grant so that I would study the number of animals that are killed on that road. And I must tell you that it was uh, it was gory. And we're able to relate the fact that there were road kills, number one, and then we're able to relate to the number of cars that go into the reserve. So we have um, cars coming to the reserve more at the weekend, and then the road kills normally increase at the weekend. And we're able to notice the, the speed the cars use to run in that reserve because um, at the gates, the entrance, you have to drive about 42 kilometers before you get to the camp of the reserve, which is right in the middle of the reserve. So we stationed somebody at the beginning of the, of the, of the road, at the end of the road, and we're able to estimate the, the, amount, the, the time it took for the drivers to get to the camp, of the, to get the camp. And at the end of the day, we're able to tabulate the time they get to the beginning of the road and the end of the road, and, and dividing it by the, the, the distance, we're able to get what speed they use to be able to, and we notice that the speed about an average of 100 kilometers per hour. And that is, I mean, that is a neck breaking speed. And that caused, that um, saw the kind of results that we got. Animals were killed from birds to ungulates to uh, rowan antelopes and even to a pregnant hartebeest that we got sometime. Unfortunately, we've, we've also, rec we also recorded um, um, some mortality in, in terms of humans. At least while, while, in the, while there in Ankara, I spent four years, um, I think a total of eight people died on that road from motor accident, very ghastly um, motor accidents. That's from the um, Ruford grant. And for the BOU small grant, I did, in my, for my master's, I did, um, I studied raptors, population of raptors in the Ankara Game Reserve. So I thought that we should also know what is happening outside of the Ankara Game Reserve. So I wrote BOU small grant and I was given BOU grants and then I was uh, I was given that grant and we did what was happening outside of the reserve. So in comparing what was happening outside of the reserve and inside of the reserve, we made it into a paper and we published it uh, on, uh, on, on a scientific journal. The third was the BES, that is British Ecological um, Society Early Ecologist Grant that we got with the help of um, Will Cresswell. I was able to get that grant and I'll talk more about that because that led me to make a presentation at the SEC as Anansi mentioned, and also went on to spend six weeks with Will um, at uh, St. Andrews. So as I said, Applore doesn't only give you theoretical knowledge, but practical hands-on hands -on skills. So while in Ankara as a research associate, I also thought about the concept of developing uh, my PhD as well. So yeah, the Ankara Game Reserve, for those of us who know the reserve, is, uh, is a kind of an island, uh, more or less a, a spherical island with about 12 roads radiating into the reserve, to the middle of the reserve where the camp is situated. So we needed to know what was happening in terms of the effects and the extent of, of anthropogenic activities on the reserve. So we do use the bird population, the mama population, and the vegetation to be able to see what's happening. So we did transects from the edge of the reserve right into the camp of the reserve to see how far um, the effect of anthropogenic activities are on the birds, on the mammals, and on the vegetation. And because of the limitation of time, I may not be able to go into the details of that. So Aplori gave me my first international exposure in terms of scientific conferences. So the first picture on my, on my, on my left is uh, the SCB um, uh, workshop in Ghana. 
I went to this workshop by road. I, I normally uh, like talking about this because my first international trip was actually by road. I went to Ghana and I presented the work of uh, my the Raptor survey that we did, and then we were able to do that. Uh, this second presentation was the SCCS in 2011, where I made a presentation about the road kills uh, by Ruford in, uh, in SCCS in Cambridge. And then the third one was about uh, modified it a bit because I had more data at that time. I'm talking about now the effect of road construction on a reserve. And then these also, at this time, I was also now writing my page because this was also um, 2013. And I was looking at my PhD and then developing it as I went on. So for my PhD, as I said, Aplori provided the foundation and then the support for my PhD. So I had my director then, Professor Manu, and then he was my director of Aplori, and he was my PhD supervisor. So I had no reason not to succeed uh, because I cannot use the excuse that, oh, my supervisor gave me work. That's why I couldn't do the work of my director at work. And on the other hand, I cannot tell my director at work, that's my, my supervisor at school gave me work. That's why I cannot do the work you've given me. So I had, I was, I, I, I was boxed out that I needed to do my work. So, and I, I, I completed my PhD in two and a half years, which is record time for, for a place like uh, Nigeria and the University of, uh, of Georgia, which is kudos uh, because they were, were always out there in the field and making things happen. So my first, this first picture is about when I was spending my, my PhD at the departmental level. And this was the graduation that we had um, during the, my PhD graduation. And after that, I was ready to launch out into conservation practice. And I had the opportunity in 20. 15, just immediately after the defense of my PhD, where I, when I was appointed as a director of technical programs of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. Now, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation is 40 years this year. In fact, on Saturday, we will be having our anniversary dinner, and then we will be celebrating 40 years of conservation. Uh, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation started when um, conservation was not the in theme. If I just give you a bit of the background of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, it was it, the idea was hatched in the early 70s. But as at that time, when the idea was sold to the Nigerian government, they thought that because WWF was associated with it, and then there was WWF, the only country that had WWF then was in South Africa. So it was thought that it was a way of smuggling in appetite through the back door. So it was shut down at that time until there was a new government in the eight, early 80s. That was when NCF uh, was, was uh, the idea of NCF started. So I'm standing on um, currently leading an organization that is 40 years old. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, humbling for me and, and all thanks to my foundation from uh, Aplori. So as I said, the current title, so I was the director of technical programs for seven years. Uh, while I came into NCF, I needed to have, from my coming from a plurry and from the ideas, very, um, uh, very sharp um, and strict ideas that I had on how to make things happen, I rejected the department and we focused on habitat, especially on forest and species conservation. We looked at climate change, environmental education, and policy and advocacy. So when I structured the, uh, I mean, the department in that light, I was able to now um, put my leads and it gave me, it gave us a direction. And when we were able to move conservation funding um, from about um, 200,000 US dollars uh, before and uh, until we're about um, a million US dollars now in uh, conservation uh, practice, I mean, conservation activities uh, in Nigeria as we implement uh, different uh, projects. So recently, I was appointed as a director general of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, as I mentioned, a 40 year organization. Now, this is my office. If you notice, this picture was taken today. Now, I have the privilege of staying in, um, in an office where I am overlooking a forest reserve. A forest reserve is 78 hectare forest reserve in the middle of urban prowling Lagos Island. Now, if you know where Lagos Island is, um, I mean, it's a, we are we are now a green a green island. Everywhere is built up. So the Lekki Conservation Center, where my office sits, is 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 a is a paradise on the island, and we we are we are very happy about it because of how much we are, we've been able to put in and what we are able to do as uh, as NCF to be able to build what we, and we, we try to showcase what can happen when you leave nature. Because this place is 30 years old, and when we got this place, it was a degraded landscape. 
And we allow it, we just kind of show what can happen if you allow nature to thrive. Nature will build back itself, nature will recover. So this serves as our laboratory where we try to show people that this is exactly what happens when nature recovers. And it's a wetland actually, and it's recognized as one of um, the wetlands of importance in, in, in Nigeria. And for Lagos State, it's a major ecotourism site. And it has moved to now having to uh, pay for itself because of the number of tourists we have. We receive over 100,000 tourists yearly, and these are even local tourists that come into the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. So as the Director General of the Foundation, we just started the new, our strong, we call it Strategic Action Plan 2021 to 2025, where we are looking at four pillars. Now we've rejected the organization to look at four pillars. We are looking at uh, saving sp uh, species imperial, we we'll call this species conservation. We have climate change, we have what we call the Green Recovery Nigeria, where we hope to galvanize efforts to ensure that everybody is involved in returning Nigeria back to at least 25% of the forest cover that we should have as, an, as a country. And we know that we cannot do it alone. And that is why we're doing it with everyone. And that's why our fourth pillar is called our pillar of partnership. We're able to galvanize people and push everybody along in one direction to see how we'll be able to recover. So that is what we are doing. And about the talk about um, NCF and about what we do, that's another, I mean, another webinar completely and all the things that we're going to. So this was a snippet of what, uh, what we do as NCF. But just to give us the importance of conservation as I close, the Lekki Conservation Center, from my window, we notice a bird species that have never been recorded before, the Narina strogon. And for those who know Narina strogon is very cryptic, a forest species. And for us, we recorded here, it was really, really um, a, a record for us. And we use that, immediately I saw that, has some pictures, and we published that as well, to show that the forest is recovering and species are coming back to continue to highlight the importance of conservation even in an urban setting. So thank you very much for taking time this evening to listen to me as I yield the floor to Will. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, OJ. Um, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. OJ is just back from COP27. And uh, we all know what that's about. Um, now on to our next speaker, if I can introduce um, Mary. Thanks, Will. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mary Monoko Odozi, and I'm country manager for Fauna and Flora International, um, Liberia. I'm going to take you through my conservation journey um, in the last almost 20 years. And all through this time, Aplori has been a part of it. So when I was growing up as a child in Benin City, Edo State, Southern Nigeria, there were not many uh, role models in conservation and the concept was not very popular. So like many people, I wanted to be a medical doctor, like OJ said, when I grew up. Um, but I got really influenced by wildlife documentaries. And by the time I got to the university to study zoology, I knew I wanted to do something related to wildlife or nature conservation. However, during my undergraduate studies at the University of Benin, um, there was very limited training and no practical experience, zero practical experience, like Will said. But I was fortunate to participate in a few um, field courses, uh, field trips one of which was um, a trip to Nigeria's, then Nigeria's second largest national park, Yankari Games Reserve. I was here with my colleagues um, from the University of Benin, our final year class. So as conservation wasn't a common topic for students, uh, for research, for thesis, projects, and so on, and topics in parasitology, fisheries, entomologies, and others were the norm. I became the only student who chose to do wildlife conservation 
as a project, as a research topic. And uh, I was opportune to have a, a course advisor who um, supported me through and introduced me to bird conservation. So my thesis work then was on the birds of Benin, Benin City. And he also introduced me to Sir Phil Hall. Um, my story or my journey, the story of my journey to Aplori will not be complete if I don't mention Phil Hall, um, whom many of you know, a renowned British ornithologist who had lived and worked in Nigeria for very many years and is currently the chair uh, of the management board of Aplori. So it was through Phil that I got to know about Aplori. And I went there, the Institute had just been established. And uh, the course hadn't started. So uh, after my bachelor's degree, um, I secured a place on the scholarship program. So like I said, the Institute had just been established and my colleagues and I became the first cohort of students. So we were the pioneer class. In this photo, you will see, this was my class. Um, the, the man standing directly behind me in glasses is Ademola Ajabi, uh, who is currently the Africa Regional Director of the Nature Conservancy. Sinta Abalak, who was the left of the screen works with Aplori, but she heads, she also heads the local organization, a local conservation organization in Nigeria. And many of you would know Mohamed Boyi and Grace Palm, who is currently on this call. I saw her chat a few minutes ago. Is in just behind me. <laughs> so at the Plori was where I got the exposure to ecological research and practical conservation like others have mentioned before me, OJ and Nanchi. Um, thanks to Dr. Cresswell, Dr. Georgina Mwansat, um, Dr. Uf Otosin, and Dr. Shiwa Manu. It helped shape my career, and it provided me the foundation to what I was to later achieve in Liberia. So on completing my master's program, I was one of the many Aplori graduates who benefited from PhD opportunities. Like Uje said, that's one thing that if there's anything Aplori does, it's to expose the students who go through the program to the various options. Um, we'll present a, a, a graph showing the various options we have um, to go do PhDs, and continuing research, and some of us um, to work in NGOs. So we got this exposure and um, were able to, um, we afforded the opportunities to do our PhDs. In my case, um, I went to Sweden, and this was facilitated through the efforts of Dr. Ulf Ottersen, whom I am. Um, grateful, eternally grateful. He was then my master supervisor at the Plori, and I was selected to join the research team of Dr. Ola Olsen at Lund University in Sweden, who was also a lecturer, who was also lecturing at the Plori whenever he had the time. So I carried out my research work at the Plori looking at the foraging ecology of granivorous birds in the Amorum forests, uh, a savannah woodland. And after my cost work at Lund in Sweden, I completed my PhD in 2010. About a, a year later, I was invited by Will um, to coordinate the Aplori Conservation Biology Master's program. And I was there for a, a few months, a few weeks, after which, not long after, I secured a position with Fauna and Flora International. 
as technical advisor for education and research. And this was what took me to Liberia. So in Liberia, I've been in Liberia for the past 10 years um, and I've had an amazing experience. And while here, I have not once been detached from a plori. A plori has followed me all through this journey. So in Liberia, I led the establishment of the Sapo Conservation Center located at um, the Sapo National Park, the largest protected area in Liberia. Uh, and the center, we established the Center for Conservation and Ecological Research and Training. And one of the things I said in my interview um, when I was, when I applied for the job was that I was going to replicate a mini aplori in Liberia. And uh, of course, I needed help from aplori. So as part of my work, I, uh, Introduce conservation modules in the curriculum of the forestry department of the University of Liberia. In fact, we ended up um, creating two conservation courses. Um, and my institution was quite open to support the collaboration that I facilitated between at Lori and the Sapo Conservation Center. And part of this collaboration was to enable Liberian students benefit from the Aplori scholarship program. So to date, four Liberians have been trained on the Aplori master's program. And Aplori at some point supported and paid for an Aplori um, lecturers, Sam Ivande, who is going to give his talk next after me, and uh, Dr. Yakat Bashep, um, both came to Liberia to help with the teaching of the conservation courses. So on this screen, in the photo on lower left, to your left, um, there's also an Aplori student that graduated, uh, Dr. Bayo. Emidayo Shinobi, who came to Liberia to support the first field course we organized in, in Liberia at the Sapo Conservation Center. You would also see Ubotu to the right, visiting Liberia, and one of the Liberian uh, Aplori graduates, Benedictus Freeman, is also in the photo. In the photo, he's the one to the extreme left. So it has been um, an amazing journey. And when it comes to capacity building in West Africa, I would say Aplori takes the lead. And not just taking the lead in training students, but taking the lead in replicating itself across, across the region. So my capacity building work in Liberia actually earned me uh, a Tusk Conservation nomination, which I was very grateful for, as it opened up more opportunities for collaboration, and it helped to attract uh, more funding. And this has enabled more impactful work and the expansion of our capacity building program in Liberia. Uh, some of my former colleagues, like Dr. Jacinta Balaka, Dr. Talat, uh, Tende and um, Yakad Bashev have come to lead um, rapid uh, bird surveys uh, in Liberia. And this has helped to uh, provide up-to-date information on the birds um, of Liberia. Dr. Craswell has also been in Liberia on his own uh, research a mission to implement some uh, projects with PhD students, so which is great. So today I'm the country manager of FFI in Liberia. And um, I want to say that the Aplori model of capacity building has been extremely successful. 
um, like I said, some of us have been able to replicate a mini version of this model. So it's like a ripple effect where those that are trained go out to train others. And then those, those others train other others further down the line. This is exactly how to build capacity for conservation, especially in Africa, where a significant percentage of the world's rarest and most threatened biodiversity exists. I'll stop here now so that um, my colleague Sami Vande would have the opportunity to present as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank, thank you very much, Mary. You didn't tell me that you knew Prince William, honestly. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Last, last but not least. Um, uh, let me introduce Sam, Sam Evandi, who is, uh, who, who uh, I said that everybody uh, came, came back uh, to Africa, and Sam indeed did that after his PhD, but he's been headhunted and he's now in, now in the US, and he'll tell you about that. Over to you, Sam. Well, thank you very much, Will. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to speak um, today on something that I have um, kind of titled The Making of a West African Conservationist. Um, I'm currently um, working um, as the Bird Conservation Coordinator at the Global Center for Species Survival in the US. I actually just moved here um, some two months ago. So some, still some settling in and adjustments uh, going on uh, at the moment, but really great to get the opportunity to talk to you today. So um, just by way of, um, of, of an introduction, and some of you have probably already heard you know, aspects of some of this, uh, this happening before. Um, so for career decisions, um, there are lots of things that sometimes you know, come into play when people are making um, that decision or I, at the stage where they're about to make that decision. And so um, I was kind of like at that stage when I completed secondary school and was about to take the entrance exams to the university. And of course, um, I had my desires and what I thought was going to be an exciting career. And I thought I wanted to be an architect. Essentially, I didn't want um, a maybe eight to five kind of job. I wanted an opportunity to design things, but then also go out and see how those things were happening. I didn't want to spend all the time in the office, essentially. So I wanted you know, something that would kind of take me outdoors. Um, but then of course, my parents had other ideas. They thought I should be a medical doctor. And um, of course, uh, you already heard uh, Dr. Onoja mentioned, you know, almost everyone wanting to be a medical doctor. Um, we had some sort of negotiations and after some back and forth, we kind of reached some sort of compromise decision that I was going to be a pharmacist. So I took the entrance exams, you know, so I could, you know, become a pharmacist um, to go to the university to study pharmacy. And then I was offered um, biology as a course. So I'm sure you can all just imagine how excited my parents were when, you know, they heard about this. Or myself, you know, like thinking, well, what am I going to do with this? Um, to be honest, I didn't really realize that people went to the university and spent years to study to become biologists. So, well, that's that's just to give you a sense of what I was thinking, you know, at the time when I was offered biology. But then very quickly, I also want to then again emphasize um, the importance of um, mentors and, you know, um, people who kind of point you in the right direction, you know, people with whom you can um, sometimes discuss some of these things and they give you guidance. Um, Will already mentioned um, um, Professor um, Augustin Ezealo, who at the time um, was, you know, I think the, the first indigenous ornithologist we had in Nigeria, had spent some time, um, was trained in the US and had just, you know, returned to Nigeria and was beginning to, you know, um, train more and more people. Um, there's also Professor Shio Amanu himself, who was a student of uh, Professor Zello, um, and then also um, then got involved and was trained and went to work also with Will, um, did a PhD in Oxford, and then returned. 
So these two people were very um, instru instrumental in kind of giving me a direction because I met both of them at the start of my undergraduate program, you know, my first year um, of undergraduate studies. And I had some conversations with them. Professor Shiwa Amandu told me, well, if you really want to spend time outdoors, then you should be doing biology. And then of course, uh, Professor Zello himself then introduced this fascinating aspect of ornithology, which was very, very, very exciting, unique and different. And so um, I kind of got interested and felt, well, there just might be something to do here. So again, just emphasizing, you know, the um, role that mentors um, um, play uh, in, in shaping, you know, our, our decisions. Um, so for my undergraduates, which was kind of like my introduction to um, my introduction to doing um, science and also my introduction to ornithology, um, Professor Zalo then kind of guided me and gave me some ideas. And so my first introduction to, you know, doing some ecology was um, just going and investigating changes in, in the composition of birds in a small botanical garden in the university. And so that really got me hooked. Well, that meant that I had to learn the birds. Um, and then I took some time, you know, going and trying to identify what bird species were there. And then was going to do a comparison with bird species that had been recorded in the same area some eight years ago. So that essentially was my introduction to, you know, ornithology and you know, beginning to ask questions of the environment using birds as uh, the focal and model species. Of course, I had heard about a plurie from these two people and then had just done, you know, like a BSc project focused on birds. So I was really keen to come, you know, and get some more training at a plurie. So uh, 2008 to 2009 was when I was at the Plory. Um, the photo you can see there is uh, me and uh, my course mates. Um, after we had just finished our, um, our uh, thesis defense, um, all of us looking all nicely dressed up, but um, you probably heard from the others. OJ was talking about the early morning um, fields, field outings that we had to do. Um, but then it was really interesting then building on some of that research experience that I got from the BSc. And so for my uh, master's, I took some time to do some assessment of a survey method that was you know, being considered um, for a citizen science program. And so um, just went out, applied, you know, tested this method, did some surveys using this method and then uh, repeated surveys just to see how how many times you would need to you know, visit a, a plot to consider that you had seen a good or a representative sample of birds in, in the area. So that again was, you know, we're building on um, the skills and um, it was really different because um, um, having, having gone through um, my undergraduate and then coming to do a master's at Plory where we got lots of exposure to people from, you know, different parts of the world, you know, top, people working in, 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 in the field of ornithology, conservation and ecology, you know, like it was really different. It was eye-opening and it was like a, a wonderful experience um, as a master's student at the Plory. Of course, there was the um, opportunity to learn some new research skills, but then I also met, met you know, other great people. So again, that's my, um, that's our cohort. Um, with Will, after Will, you know, had just finished um, our statistics and ecology classes. Um, but then I'm also mentioning that, um, you know, the opportunities to collaborate and network that the Plory, you know, creates from even within, um, within a cohort. And so um, you also probably had um, um, Zingfa being mentioned and then Fidel. So this, um, were other, uh, my colleagues uh, during the master's course. And as soon as we finished, we came together and put in an application uh, to do um, a conservation focused project on the gray next Bicatatis under the conservation leadership program. And so we got this uh, future conservationist grant award, which then um, gave us the opportunity to spend some time within the um, forests in Southeast Nigeria um, to kind of update, do a reassessment and update information about the conservation status of this regional endemic uh, bird species. So again, really, interesting um, opportunity to then work together and continue to develop um, as, as a conservationist. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I, so 
at the Plory was also where I met Will. And um, of course, I mentioned that he taught me um, at the Plory, lots of um, inputs into my master's research. But then afterwards, I was really keen to have um, that project uh, presented at the SSC, um, so the Student Conference in Conservation Science, you know, in Cambridge. And so some conversations, you know, about going to have that presentation then eventually led to the offer of a PhD, um, which was really exciting for me, the opportunity to then get even further training, further development, you know, as, 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 as a researcher, as a scientist. Um, but then all of this was made possible, you know, because I met Will at Aplori. So again, just mentioning um, the opportunities that Aplori has created to connect people, with, you know, with, with others and then opportunities for us to continue to develop. So for my PhD, um, I spent lots of time visiting different sites and habitats, um, did a big transect traveling across uh, Nigeria from the north all the way to the south doing some surveys for uh, migratory birds. Um, essentially, we're trying to understand what factors influence the uh, non-breeding ecology of these birds. And well, in a nutshell, I'm not going to tell you all about the PhD now, but essentially we found that um, migratory birds are, you know, appear to utilize habitats in very similar ways as um, related Afrotropical resident birds. But then the key point is that, you know, in, Continuing the work to improve the habitat for resident birds will also benefit migratory birds. So it was a really you know, exciting time and opportunity for me to continue my development. So since finishing that PhD, I returned um, to Aplori, where I had the opportunity to uh, continue to contribute to the capacity building efforts at Aplori, um, both uh, contributing to the research work, but also um, continue contributing to um, teaching of the other uh, students. Dr. Mary already mentioned that I had the opportunity to visit um, Liberia through the collaborations that happened. Um, I'm really excited um, you know, that I had that opportunity. Um, also, I was able to then visit the University of Cape Coast, another um, um, relationship that is been, has been developed between Aplori and the University of Cape Coast in Ghana for additional capacity development. So I've, you know, I've been opportune to participate in and contribute to all of this work, again, thanks to, to Aplori. And I was especially, you know, uh, excited, you know, when I had the opportunity to, to do all of this work. So um, something else that I had the opportunity to do was to, you know, contribute to the development of citizen science in Nigeria, using bird watching as a way to get people to connect with nature and the environment. And so, um, also, when I returned, um, I was then kind of um, tasked with the responsibility to set up this project, um, the Nigerian Bird Atlas project. Again, key emphasis um, gets more of the public engaged in conservation. And the tool we we're going to use was bird watching. But then, like Will mentioned, not very many people, um, you know, not very many professionals. The capacity was being developed at the time when we started in 2015. We kind of had a pool of about 100 ornithologists to work with. And so clearly we knew that it was something, you know, that we had to reach out. So um, what was going to be, you know, an atlas for birds started, you know, with a, a map of people. And at the time we were kind of mapping out to see where a lot of the Aplori alumni network was in the country. And so we reached out to lots of all of these people, um, introducing all of this idea to them and, you know, continued um, to, 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 to encourage them to pass on these skills to others. But one of the key things that came out of this was that all of these people we encouraged kind of um, had roles to play. And in all of this work, we were able to set up not less than 20 bed clubs. I think now the number is up to 30 bed clubs in Nigeria. But all of this was made possible with this uh, network of um, Aplori alumni spread across the country. And all of these people are contributing and making great contributions to bird conservation, biodiversity cons conservation in Nigeria and across the region. So it's really exciting to see that. I think we're only able to talk about large scale and almost near real time bird monitoring in Nigeria, you know, because of all of this uh, capacity development work. So it's really exciting to see all of that. The maps here just show areas where, you know, people in the various bird clubs have had the opportunity to go out and actually do some bird surveys. So all of this yellow you see on the screen just shows areas where people have gone to do bird surveys, you know, looking 
and at least putting up lists for birds. So I was really, you know, I, I, it remains one of the most exciting aspects of uh, the work that I've been able to do. So currently I work as the conservation coordinator of birds at the Global Center for Species Survival, which is a partnership between the IUCN, SSC and the Indianapolis Zoo. Um, essentially the day-to-day, -day, um, what that means is that, you know, I am supporting the SSC chair's office with um, coordination of a, a network of volunteer conservation scientists and managers, many of whom provide technical advice, you know, for biodiversity conservation work. There are some odd 160 specialist groups, um, but I work mainly with the 20 um, bird specialist groups where all of these conservationists are working. So it's really exciting, you know, to do all of this work, um, contributing and helping them, you know, as we all work towards um, improving our opportunities for doing species assessments, also conservation planning and action. So that's where I'm currently at now. And um, well, it's it's been an exciting journey. And I would just like to summarize and say, well, as you would have heard, you know, the journey to becoming a successful biologist, you know, is not quite clear cut, but somehow many of us are finding our way, you know, there. And you have heard about the role of mentors in pushing us in the right direction. Um, well, it's still not a priority for, you know, people wanting to do conservation um, within Nigeria, but it's improving, you know, thanks to organizations like Aplori. And so, well, um, I will again say um, thank you so much to Aplori and everyone, you know, all of the other people who have spoken. And, uh, well, thank you all for listening as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, well, that's, you've got a pretty good idea of uh, the Aplori story there. And I just want to finish with one, one last thing, that if there's one message from these different, different stories or any time you hear somebody talking about their journey in conservation, conservation is all about people. It's not actually about animals. It's about people. It's about relationships between people and it's about engaging people. And it's about trust between people. And that is the means by which we actually do conserve uh, the environment. And I think Aplori is a, is a great example. One of the reasons I'm most proud of it is that it's very much a people oriented organization. Our aim is to increase capacity, but actually what, we, what we're trying to do is to improve people people's lives, and that then leads to improving the environment. Anyway, thank you very much. We're here to answer any questions. Thank you, Will. Um, before we start with the q and I I would just like to um, yeah, acknowledge the uh, staff and management from, from Aplori in, that are in here this evening with us. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, congratulations on the great work that you are doing. Thank you for the difference that you are making. And then also um, just a massive thank you to the four um, to the four students who are not students anymore. Um, they seem to be eternal students. Um, thank you first of all for bringing your warmth and friendliness and enthusiasm to our screens. Um, 2020, 2022 has not been an easy year for many people and in the conservation community there's a new word that popped out um, uh, called eco-anxiety and I think the best way to address eco-anxiety is to um, is, is to is to come up with winning stories like these uh, success stories in the conservation industry and it's wonderful to see African people coming up with African solutions to African problems. Um, it's it, congratulations. We acknowledge your uh, current contribution to conservation as well as your education story. And each one of you showed us where education can take you. It's a, sometimes a strange story and a uh, and uh, it doesn't always take you where you expect to take you, but it's 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 a wonderful inspiration for us. Thank you very much. Um, well, I would just like to to mention that um, 
you you said that it's an easy thing to put up an institution like this but um <laughs> i think there's a little bit more to it than that um I also like to mention that in our in our conversations with with all four of the um speakers this evening they all mentioned you as a key figure in in their development so congratulations for your role in in their education um and thank you for your contribution um oh, i you. just want to jump the queue a little bit with the q and a um this evening and ask will the first question and my first question to will is how did uplory start how did the whole thing come about um this is another hour hour long presentation but i'll, I'll be very 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 quick um it it essentially comes in the vision of of one man um uh, tasso leventis who had has business uh, interests um, around the world, but yeah, has a major business interest, a Coca-Cola franchise in uh, Nigeria. And he grew up uh, in Nigeria. Uh, he's a British um, businessman, but he spent a lot of time in, in Nigeria. But he's a passionate uh, bird photographer conservation and conservationist. And the country that he grew up in that he loves, he could see it needed needed help. And his uh, children um, at the time were going to Oxford and Oxford has this fantastic um, institute, the Edward Gray Institute, one of the world's best ornitho you know, centers of ornithological research. And Tasso's crazy dream was, well, why don't we have an EGI in, uh, in Nigeria? And so he had this idea and by chance, I was um, walking through a forest in Nigeria, bird watching, and somebody was coming along the uh, trail towards me with a huge camera. And uh, it was Tasso. And I didn't know who he was, uh, but we got chatting. That's what you do. I showed him some birds. He got some nice photos, red shouldered cuckoo shrike, if I remember. And uh, we ended up having lunch. And he told me about his, his dream. And I said, oh, what a coincidence, I'm at the Edward Gray Institute, I can connect you with the right people. And uh, let, let's see what happens. And uh, with that's basically uh, the, start, the start of it. The really key, not so much the, the building or whatever, you need money to do this. And Tasso set up an endowment and that provides the running costs forever um for for app lorry and there we are mm, another story of one thing led to another um and with that i would like to open the floor to questions um please use the uh reaction tools at the bottom of the screen and don't be shy um also you're welcome to ask questions in the chat if you if you perhaps have problems with your connection and that's easier that way, please do. Um, there are a lot of um, comments and um, well wishes and thank yous in in the chat. Uh, Richard Masibedi is asking in the chat. It would be interesting to know how Aplori tracks its alumni so well, or is it because the yearly intake isn't very large? Um, yeah, good, good point. You say that we track them really well, but I get frustrated because, you know, we've, I don't have 15, I don't know the destinations of 15% of, of the uh, alumni at any one time. It is, a, it's a close knit community and you're absolutely right. It, it, it is a very small number as much as I'm very proud of what, what's happening at App Laurie. It's a, it's a drop in the ocean. It's so, so tiny. And the reason that we could show you that graph of the, the difference that Aplori's made is because you're really starting from, from almost nothing. So, you know, if you're half full or a half empty kind of person, you, you can look at it, look at it both, both way. In conservation, it's best to be half full rather, rather than half empty because it, because it, it keeps, keeps you going. But the main reason that the alumni that we know about the alumni is that it is still quite a small community. Holly Magog, you're welcome to ask your question. Okay, I can unmute. 
Will, I mean, I'm attached on the back of, of Richard's question is, I mean, why did you choose to have such a small number every year? And have you ever considered, because obviously what you put your outdoory students through is a very, very thorough teaching and also a huge amount of field work to show that you do need to be in the field and that's as important as academia. And I think across Africa, you know, a lot of, a lot of people push academia and I certainly find having grown up in East Africa that that's the level that everyone wants to be at but they forget that the field experience is as as important so have you ever thought just out of interest nothing publishable but to compare you know for example one of the wildlife training institutes that's churning out 100 200 people every year where are their destinations? Because I'll bet that you guys are making way more of a difference and your drop in the ocean is a pretty big drop. What do you reckon? I, I don't know. I, 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 I agree with you about the importance of field work. Uh, it, ab, abs, absolutely crucial that the, the connection and grounding it, make it, make it real, realistic and the proper applied discipline that con conservation is. Yeah, there's plenty of theory, but yeah, it's boots on the ground. It's talking people with people engage, in, engaging um, people. But, but yes, it's connection, like you say, and you've created these incredible close connections that if you had a class of 200, you wouldn't have those connections. No, we, we wouldn't. And I'm, you know, in my, in my my other day job when I'm teaching at St Andrews, then yeah, I'm teaching teaching to class mm -hmm. of maybe maybe a hundred hundred or, or two hundred, and you you do try to create the the same connection, but it's not it it doesn't work as effectively. I, I mean, why have we got such small classes? Um, it's economics, but I I think that that is the secret to to our success. We're trying to trying to really invest and. Most importantly, not just create graduates, but to create career paths for graduates, because that, that's the really important thing. You can give people degrees in conservation biology, but if they can't go off and, and apply it, then that's that's not well, you've you've created better people, but you have then on the other way, you can have students that you offer chances of PhDs and they're just not up for the job because a PhD is a pretty full time big commitment so if you are taking 12 students and you know every one of them is up to the job then Lund and Oxford and these other universities are going to be offering PhDs very often because they know they're going to have students who complete no I think the the real what makes our plori I mean not, not particularly different but what it is the thing that really makes it successful in this res respect is that our teaching model has always been to bring in external lecturers so if i go to a conference i'm going to be at the pan-african ornithology um, conference on sunday uh i'll be hustling be talking to people about that lorry and they'll listen to me, me pattering and, and say oh that sounds great and then i'll say well come come to our just come teach for two weeks we'll pay you pay your flights we'll look after you you know whatever you've heard about nigeria you'll come back again everyone that's come to our glory um, <laughs> comes back again and so they come they get enthused and these people from all over the world they've got research uh, groups in different universities and somewhere down the line two three years it might be might be five years they'll take a take an uplory student on and so that this networking and just connect connecting up of bringing the external lecturers in i think is one of our keys well, well, I can tell you and all four of you who spoke today, I think this has been the most inspiring night I've had of the whole year. So thank you, everyone. And Holly, you look just like the kind of person that should probably come to our and do some teaching. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I think you might be needing to teach me, but uh, I think we will be in touch anyway, seeing as I think every one of the speakers today deserves also a whole hour to tell some of their stories. So thanks again, everyone. It's been incredible. I'm going to go to bed with a smile on my face. Um, Richard Mazabedi is also commenting that the idea of using alumni to set up bird clubs across the country is really amazing. So yeah, also 
congratulations on that. I think it was in Sam's presentation where he showed that he started 20, something like 20 bird clubs. That's amazing by itself. Yes, um, I mean, it's it's one of, like I said, it's one of the most exciting things that has happened, you know. So from some of the formal opportunities that people get to learn and then moving to this sort of semi-formal and informal opportunities to continue to you know, share these ideas and this message about conservation. And for me, that is the best thing that that represents. Um, like I said, we were looking to you know, have this atlas and get citizen scientists involved in this. But then the first thing we had to do was where are the people that can drive this? And that map of people was very crucial in the initial strategy you know, going out and building these bed clubs around people who already had um, the skills. And essentially that's what underpins all of the, uh, you know, like the, the, the messaging that goes out. So you need people who have the capacity to have the skills, but then who are also willing to share that in whatever form or format, be it formal or you know, informal. And I think that's one of the best things that this represents. Hmm. I saw a comment in the chat um, about somebody that, that just corrected um, one of the speakers and mentioned that I applied for um, conservation or zoology. Um, so I was wondering, are you slowly starting to see an uptick in, in people who are actually applying to now, from the beginning, go into conservation as a career? Yes, so as uh, more and more awareness about what can happen in um, with zoology as a background, as that as more and more awareness continue to grow, then uh, people are going into it because actually it was it was out of uh, lack of awareness that made people feel that uh, many zoology graduates end up as their DSC. Uh, and then end up in the classroom teaching probably just secondary school and I mean and zoology gives you a, a lot a whole wide opportunity to go out there and specialize in one field or the other because once you specialize in one field or the other then you become an expert and then I mean you're, boom you have a lot of things ahead of you to do so but we didn't have that orientation from the start we only had parents who wanted uh, medicine, uh, surgery, uh, pharmacy, architecture, some of these professional courses, and then limited our choices so that people, when we come out of zoology, because we didn't start in a, in a good footing, a lot of uh, people come out with um, third class, not very good grades to be able to pursue postgraduate. So that's where this problem come from. But when people come out with, uh, I mean, go in with uh, that but um, awareness, they go in very strong and come out very strong and are able to proceed with postgraduate studies. Mm. I mean, I can also add that some of the, the opportunities for people to have um, some career guidance early, um, we need to increase those opportunities. So in my case, for example, um, I didn't want to study biology, but then in my first year, you know, someone helped me to figure out that what I really wanted for a career could be done, you know, in this area. And so as more and more people are beginning to realize because everybody felt like, you know, the path to um, a successful life kind of was within the fields of medicine, engineering, um, law, you know, and things like that. But then we're also beginning to realize that there are lots of things that, you know, people can do in other areas, including in ecology. Um, for me, one of the, so one of the simple selling points was, you know, that opportunity to spend time outdoors. And I couldn't figure out at that time that, you know, this was a great way to do it. And because that happened to me, you know, I've had the, and when I've had the opportunity to talk to young students, you know, who are thinking about a career, I just asked, what exactly do you, you know, would you like to do most, most, most of all? And then, you know, you can fit that into, you know, whatever it is that you then go to the university to do. So if you like the outdoors, then yeah, biology can be a great, you know, way for you to connect. Um, well, just to add that um, one of the things that sweetened the deal for me was, well, you will get the opportunity to travel. And so um, <laughs> I kind of liked, you know, that was one of the, 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 the things that got me hooked, you know, so yeah, but it's good. Fantastic, Holly. Um, I guess I see some, um, Grace Ham in the, in the um, chat box has talked about the upsurge in applicants and I, I don't know how many people on here know about the university application system in Nigeria 
I'm not going to try and describe it, but it's pretty unique in Africa. So maybe Grace could describe it because even if you, if the way I understand it is you apply for your first choice, second choice, third choice, right? And then you just get placed and sometimes you don't even get one of those. I mean, I see Sam nodding, but I, I probably haven't got it exact, but it's pretty incredible. So perhaps someone could tell us in, in the audience how that works. Um, Grace can go for it. Okay, thank you. So, yes, there's that um, that level of um, selection, first, second, third options. But now we're getting to see that even more applicants go straight for zoology, and um, because they they understand now that actually they used to think it was you go having to work in the zoos. And with the number of people now around role models that they can see. And I think with the opportunities that they see this um, role models having, they are able to desire to read zoology even, even more now. And even from not only ornithology, um, they see what the entomologists, for example, are able to do with research on diseases and so on, they see the opportunities that zoology presents for people to be able to contribute to society. So I just think that there's been a shift in how it used to be presented and how the role models that were <laughs> before us as zoologists um, presented themselves. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really um, not just like OJ said, when you come to the university and they couldn't give you medicine, pharmacy and so on, they push you to zoology. Now it's students really applying to, to study zoology. That's, that's so great to hear. And Marty, I'm gonna ask one more thing or I'm gonna put one more thing out there because I met this very interesting vulture, um, vulture conservationist who came from Nigeria. I only met him online. He gave a talk to my students because I teach as well. And he had been doing research on people who get conservation biology degrees and where do they then go with that? And there was one vulture guy who had got, he was a, a doctor. He'd got a PhD in vultures and he had found the way to make the best money was to go into trading vultures in traditional medicine because he was a doctor. So he had more credibility, the people who were not in the know thought that, you know, he understood that they really was the story behind traditional medicine in vultures. And it was a really sad story, actually, because he had, was making so much money in this position. So it's not really a question, I'm just putting that out there, that I found that pretty interesting. And from that, I guess, to Marty. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Hi guys, it's weird. Um, Holly, your question kind of leads into to where I was going, so it is a bit uh, interesting. But yeah, guys, thanks firstly for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. I just wanted to, you know, in terms of funding for research, there always has to be that side of things. And I was just wondering, you know, is there almost also an overlap or an opportunity for guiding um, to to be available? I mean, I, I think from the talk, you know, there's a very strong um, emphasis on science and research and all that, which is, which is great. But is there actually um, the uh, enough funding for the amount of positions that, 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 that well, not enough positions for the amount of students that are, are coming out with qualifications? And is there opportunity for um, people to actually still earn a living with the training that they have, but doing guiding or that, are there developed sort of, or um, guiding um, opportunities in the countries where you guys are um, practicing like Nigeria? With, within Nigeria, it's that there's not, not so much uh, the market as you might have, say East, Eastern, Eastern, Southern Africa for, for bird guides, but that, that can, that can certainly develop. And, and some of the Aplori uh, uh, alumni are our guides in the sense that um, I've just had a conversation with um, Dio, who's, who's one of the early early graduates who's just on uh, uh, on a being a guide on a cruise ship all the way down down to uh, Antarctica uh, and back. So complete transferable skills. That isn't what he does, 
but he just that's a good opportunity as i'm sure you know to earn quite a bit of money in two yeah. months and have a have a great time and uh, and then go and do your real job yeah. well so that, that sort of hence the question because i think sometimes that you know doing the pure research and science is, is quite difficult to to earn a living so um if there are opportunities for um guiding and that um that, that's kind of why i ask but john thanks a lot um is that a racket tailed roller behind your head uh no it's a i think a european roller not a racket tail <laughs> oh, shame <laughs> <laughs> Uh, either either a lilac breast or, or a European, I can't quite remember. I took the photo a while ago. A while ago. <laughs> okay, there's a there's a question from uh, Murphy Clardy. Hi everyone. I didn't get if up Laurie just focuses on um, studies on the conservation biology or birds, or it includes everything that includes birds like immunology like uh, likes of bird flu physiology etc um, if somebody can please clarify for him there the question is also in the chat well i mean it's uh, if i could go um, well i mean it's a, a a big diversity of um, of engagements and projects so um, of course, from the early days, uh, there was lots of focus on birds and bird conservation, and then doing lots of um, survey and population studies, but that has di diversified a lot. Um, some people are also doing you know, immunology work. Some people are doing um, other aspects of, um, um, of physiology as well. Um, I think uh, uh, you would get a whole range so from the from the range of masters projects and the PhDs that then you know go on to happen, um, also recently um, a molecular ecology lab has just been set up. So again, further broadening the you know the areas, the research areas that people are able to get into. So um, it's a broad range. This this thing about um, studying studying birds and ornithology. When you call it ornithology, it sounds very sort of obscure and a niche and i've been an ornithologist birdie person since a, a very young age and often i found myself apologizing but actually i've stopped apologizing because birds are a route they're a really accessible route to take science to take knowledge of the environment conservation enthusiasm uh, for, for nature you talk to anybody and even if they grumpily say oh i don't know anything about birds you just keep chatting to them. And after a couple of minutes, they're telling you their bird stories and what they saw in the garden yesterday and, and the whole lot. It, it, it's, you know, it's the initial thing that gets, gets people in. And of course, it's not really about birds. It's much, much wider. But focusing up Laurie on birds is not such a bad thing. Mm. Yeah, it, it makes conservation accessible to a lot of people. It's, it's, a it's, just, it's just brilliant fun. I mean, the world would be a much happier place if everybody was out birding. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Well, when we have talked to people, especially through the bird clubs, when we have talked to people about birding, we have always referred to birds as a window to nature. So it's just that first step that takes you out. And um, one of the things we also noticed with the development of citizen science through bird watching was people went out to look for birds and then started looking at butterflies, you know, looking at flowering plants, looking at various other things, you know, got interested in different things. So essentially, you know, the birds are just that window that people, you know, begin to look through and then you see lots of other things that could excite you and get your interest. Indeed, indeed. I love uh, Will's comment there. Birds are the gateway drug to conservation. <laughs> it's a good way to get you addicted. Peter Mills, please ask your question. Hi, Johan. Hi, Will and your team. Thank you very much for your, your very interesting presentation. It's great to see the, the work that is going on in West Africa, um, but right at the beginning, Will, you did mention that 
there's very little going on up there. Um, from the Game Rangers Association side, we have quite a few um, growing chapters over there that, that in Nigeria, Liberia, specifically Cote d'Ivoire. And I was just wondering if you want to link up, just I've, I've left my email address on the, in the chat box. So if you want to link up or contact me and, and maybe we could link up there. I don't know, maybe you've chatted with them already or in contact with them, but um, it would just be nice to, to um, make these linkages. Because in conservation, that, that, that's the name of the game. We have to talk to each other and work with each other. Thank you. That, 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 that's a great offer. As, as, far as, I, as far as I know, we don't, we don't have linkages. Anybody else? The wiser? No, but this is perhaps a wonderful opportunity as Marty asked, you know, are there opportunities for these, um, for the students to go into and here we perhaps have a, a, a step in the right direction. Yeah, I'd, it, it, it's so, so about uh, net, networking and, and connectivity to bang that, bang that drum uh, again. So thank, thank you. Yes, I'll email you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Peter Moles. Any further questions? Sam, what's the time where you are now? Um, it's just getting to two o'clock, so it's uh, okay. two in the afternoon at least. Yeah, two in the afternoon. Yeah, just getting to two in the afternoon. Great. Yeah. Um, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank our panel. It was a great evening. Your enthusiasm was exactly the right medicine that we needed this time of the year to carry us through to the end of the year. Um, we would really like to talk to you again and also um, stay in touch in terms of Share Screen Africa um, to, to uh, spread your expertise um, among the African conservation community. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. We look forward to seeing you again when um, Hannah Tanner is going to be talking to us about the uh, Rhino Community Project in Zimbabwe next week. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah.